So welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today, I have Mark Hurst. Hi, Mark. Hi, Adrian. How are you doing? Are you, are you well? Doing just fine, thank you. Excellent. Now, so Mark, for the benefit of our listeners and readers, can you tell us a bit about you and a bit about the work that you do? Sure. Uh, I'm the founder and president of a company called Creative Good, mm -hmm. which is a consulting and services firm here in New York City. Uh, I founded the company in 1997, so the last millennium. We've been around for a long time, and we focus on creating good experience. Chiefly in our consulting operation, we help clients create better experiences for their customers um, in retail and finance, media, consumer products, and so on. We also run a social network called The Councils for digital executives, people who are themselves in charge of some customer experience. Okay. And um, for 10 years, I've run the Gel Conference, which um, uh, spotlights leaders in experience design. And we've featured uh, people like Jimmy Wales giving the first ever conference talk about his project called Wikipedia. Um, and some other really amazing speakers have spoken first at Gel. And um, maybe what I'm most excited about right now is that we have just come out with our new book. My business partner, Phil Perry, and I co-authored it. The book is called Customers Included, and it talks about how to create great customer experiences and why so many companies and organizations have trouble doing that. Excellent. You, you've just preempted my next question because I was going to ask you about the book, but customers included. So can you tell us a little bit about it? I mean, about why it came about and what's the, the real sort of purpose of the book? Well, the purpose of the book is to offer a message that we feel some responsibility to get out into the world, uh, which we think has been sorely lacking in the in the conversation around business and technology and innovation um, over the last decade plus. Okay. So that mess that message is that it's essential to include customers in some significant way in the innovation process or in the decision process. Mm -hmm. All too often there are major decisions made by companies and organizations that affect end users or customers or citizens or patients or students in some way. And those people are not at all included in the decision. And we go through a number of case studies in the book about how this happens. Um, but we didn't, we didn't want to simply diagnose the problem. We wanted to prescribe a solution. Okay. And we did so very, uh, I think, very simply and very clear, clearly from the title of the book. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than totally ignoring those people, how about including them some way uh, in the process? Now, before we get into that sort of that sort of process and, and, and your approach, the, 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 you say one thing early on in the book, and, and you talk about how the idea of companies becoming customer-centered or customer-centric, and you assert that this is impossible. I mean, can you tell me a little bit about why you say that? Because I, I read that and I went, really? Huh. Can you explain more? Sure. We've heard a lot about being customer-centered over the years. Usually it's an executive being quoted in a press release who says something like, with our company, customers are always number one. The Everything we do revolves around the customer. Well, right. Transparently, you know that that is just not true. For many companies, they are, if not centered, they are extremely interested in shareholder value or for a startup, you know, getting some returns to their uh, investors. Uh -huh. there, there are many other concerns that executives have. And, and those, by the way, I don't think are bad things. Mm -hmm. I just think it's a little silly to say that everything in an organization revolves around the customer. It simply doesn't. Right. Um, so that's, that's a problem. But what we think is the, the really dangerous outcome of that is that, executives and entrepreneurs look at that and they say, ah, you know, 
I mean, customer centered is uh, let's let's be honest, that's impossible. So let's not worry about customers too much because we can't be customer centered. So let's kind of ignore them, I guess, and and go our own way. In other words, they go to the other extreme and leave start leaving customers out. And what has happened, especially in a lot of the talk about innovation recently, very rarely hear about customers. It's uh, generally, you know, think think up big thoughts and give it to customers because after all, customers don't know what they want until they see it. So there's no there's no need to even try to take a step towards including customers. And that's a that's a very dangerous state of affairs. That I mean, that's that's very much from the um, the temple of Steve Jobs, is it not? Sort of customers don't really know what they want. Yes, that is exactly where it comes from. The only the only way I would uh, reword what you said is it's not so much from the temple of Steve Jobs as it is from the temple of the myth of Steve Jobs. Okay, they're very good. Yes, no, I I, I completely get that because he did well, actually ha- he did actually say you know start with the 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 customer experience and then work back to the technology. That's right. That's exactly right. There's there's a whole chapter in customers included about Steve Jobs where we try to offer a different side to his legacy that has not really been covered up to this point, which was his commitment to the customer experience. Mm-hmm. So very rarely hear about that. Generally hear his quotes saying customers don't know what they want until they see it and many, many reminders that he did not like traditional customer research like focus groups sure. um, none of which we dispute but there's there is plenty of other evidence to um, to show that he was he was deeply committed to the customer experience and in fact was willing to stake his uh, career on it mm-hmm. um, there's a you'll see in the book there's a uh, there's a moment in 1997 which was a very dark time for Apple when uh, when Jobs had to decide how he was going to describe Apple's recovery plan, and he explicitly staked Apple's recovery on a focus on the customer experience. Mm-hmm. Okay, so going back to the customer centered idea, and you talked about how executives or entrepreneurs they when they see that it's it's impossible to be wholly customer centered and you have to take and take on more concerns than that and then when, and when that happens they tend to ignore it in the book you also then use a couple of examples like SBI net and Netflix as examples of where they've they have then taken well just ignored the customers and actually um, come a bit of a cropper as it were can you tell us a bit a bit more about what happened there and what, what we can learn from some of those examples? Sure. Well, SBI Net, um, we should say the the full name is the Secure Border Initiative, yes, which was a project a few years ago in the southwest of the U.S. And by the way, bo- both uh, SBI Net and Netflix case studies are, are available at customersincluded.com in an excerpt, so there, your okay. listeners and readers can uh, can read the the full case study online. Okay. SBI Net, also known as the Border Fence, was this uh, plan by the federal the um, the federal government to track illegal border crossings in 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 southern Arizona, illegal border crossings from Mexico into the U.S. across that border, mm-hmm. and the plan was to have a network of uh, essentially sen- uh, towers bristling with um, with high tech sensors right. that would see when someone was gonna uh, when, when humans were, were coming across the border, they would alert the border patrol agents who would drive over the very bumpy desert and um, and go uh, meet uh, meet the people doing the crossings mm-hmm. and they the the federal government spent several hundred million dollars. I mean, it was close to a billion dollars. The The lead contractor was Boeing. And when the system finally launched, the federal government uh, called it uh, a complete disaster and they shut it down, which I understand is rather unusual for a large federal program to be completely shut down. But it, SBI Net got shut down. It was a total waste. And the Looking into the reasons for that, I found some 
the Government Accountability Office reports that detailed it um, all, very early on in the project. Very, uh, the GAO reports were talking about uh -huh. what the problems were. And the problems starting from the very beginning were the agents, the agents were saying, look, nobody ever asked us what kind of technology we needed. They're handing us these uh, laptops that were supposed to place inside of our uh, cars or Jeeps as we were driving over the uh, desert roads, and you can't really use a laptop very easily when you're driving across a bumpy desert. So whatever data they were getting, and a lot of it was faulty from, from poorly designed sensors, the agents couldn't actually use it. Uh -huh. So near the end of the project, there's a, there's a famous TV program here in the U.S. called 60 Minutes. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of uh, investigative journalism. They sent their host to talk to the head of SBI Net and, and ask what was going on. And um, the host had a very explicit conversation with the head of SBI Net and said, <clears throat> "Here, you, it was some, it's not an exact quote, but something like, here, you know, you you had a huge budget to build something." Didn't anyone ever think to ask the agents what they needed? It seems like uh, kind of a big mistake not to ask the agents what they needed before you built it. Mm -hmm. And the head of SBI Net said, oh, yeah, huge mistake, huge mistake. And there was a national TV, a, a, a clear cause and effect showing the cost of ignoring the customer and right. demonstrating that it happens in some of the – largest initiatives in the country. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the, the border fence case study showing uh, showing that it does happen quite quite often troublingly and that it is a very a very expensive mistake. But lest people think this is only about, you know, enormous institutional projects, we then talked about uh, Netflix's mistake from a few years ago when they tried to spin off um, a separate company to hold on to the DVD business, and they named it uh, Quickster. Right. And they did this through a series of um, poorly written announcements uh, that they clearly, they were just so tone deaf, they didn't have any sense of what customers would think or how they would respond. So they, they began by um, raising the monthly subscription price 60%, and informing customers that this was a terrific value for them, as though it was a benefit right. them, that they were going to raise the subscription price. And then when people complained, then they said, oh, uh, yeah, sorry about that. But by the way, we're splitting your account into uh, two different companies, and the new company is called Quickster. The level of, <laughs> of customer response to these moves was, I think, unheard of in American business history. <coughs> I mean – Thousands and thousands and thousands of people were commenting on Netflix's own blog and tweeting and putting things on Facebook. That was even made fun of in uh, Saturday Night Live. Right. I mean, when you when you get when you get a skit on Saturday Night Live making fun of you, you know it's it's in the culture. Yes. And finally, Netflix reversed its decision, and CEO Reed Hastings later told journalists that it had all been a mistake based on. Uh, arrogance, right? Um, so they which made some came from his they made, they past made, success. They made, yeah, they made some really, really big assumptions and never actually tested those assumptions. Well, yes, they and exactly how Netflix could have, as you say, tested or, or observed people is a whole other conversation. Yeah. But what we're trying to do at the beginning of the book is just establish uh, a couple of major thoughts. Number one, yes. Companies and organizations do commonly ignore the customer in the innovation process and in the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. it's, hard to, it's hard to believe at first, but when you start looking around, you see examples of it everywhere. I mean, I see examples really on a, on a daily basis, Adrian. Yeah. Um, well, as <laughs> so be the, uh, careful reading this book yeah, because no, you I, will start seeing it everywhere. Well, no, and, I, I, I do it too because I look at some of the, some things and I, and I just look at that and go, uh, really? You really right. think that's going to work? <laughs> right. And obviously uh, you, you did not spend uh, any time at all thinking or observing uh, customers or talking to them. Yeah. 
to think about how and so that's that's one one major point we wanted to make is that this does happen and the other major point is that it is a very very expensive mistake yes so that and and especially considering how inexpensive it is to get the the relevant customer knowledge which we cover in the in the second part of the book it's really not that difficult to spend time with customers and and understand what their key element needs are and yet companies skip that step all the time and then they pay a price on the scale of what Netflix paid or indeed what US taxpayers paid in the almost billion dollar payment we had to make for the complete failure which was the border fence so you've um, you've talked about Early on, you talked about a process and and that you outline in the book, and perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about the, the process because there's like three major steps in the process that you suggest companies follow in order to get, if you like, their customers included. And because um, if you uh, if you could tell us a bit more about that, that would be that would be great. And because I think what's all, would also be interesting as well is is also in your experience if you could help point out where you think most companies go wrong in that respect as well. Sure. Well, I'll answer the second question first, which okay. is that we we often see that companies actually don't do any of these three steps. Okay. So this, <laughs> that's where they go wrong. <laughs> there's, there's there's not one that's a, you know more commonly skipped than the others. They're all they're all pretty pretty often uh, ignored. The three steps, if you want to include customers, the three steps are number one, observe customers directly. Mm-hmm. And and we we unpack that statement quite a bit in, uh, in in one or two chapters. Don't simply read about customers. Observe them. Observe them in person. That means getting getting out from behind your desk and spending time with customers in person. Yes. Um, and observe customers directly, not indirectly, like reading a report about them or or just dispatching someone else to do it and then hearing about it later. Observe customers. Directly. Can I make but, a make a point about that? Because it's, when you say observes customers directly, that that probably also means observe customers directly, but and also do it firsthand. Don't necessarily rely on third hand or third parties to do it for you. That's right. That's right. I mean, I, I, as a customer experience consultant, it, it may be strange to hear me say this, but yes, you need to you need to be involved in it yourself. Yes. Now, it turns out a, a good consultant. Um, will will bring the team along so that they're observing customers directly, mm-hmm. even as they facilitate it. That's that's what we do at Creative Good. Mm-hmm. But yes, it's everyone's responsibility. If they're a part of the decision, they need to they need to be a part of those customer observations. Uh, that's step one. Mm-hmm. Step two is discover the customer's key unmet needs. Okay, and that's so important. I mean. It's one thing to observe customers, mm-hmm. but it's another thing to actually discover what it is they want. I mean, you can commission some really expensive and fancy ethnographic study and get a report back about all kinds of social structures, and I don't even know what they would come back with. Yeah. There's, there's an infinite number of possibilities of lots things of, you can learn about of, customers. A lots of very fancy, fancy and expensive scientific research. Exactly. So what's the point of the research? The point is we're trying to find out what do customers want? Mm-hmm. And in the words we use in the book, what are the customer's key unmet needs? Yeah. And this, by the way, is not a new idea. I mean, uh, we, we say this repeatedly in the book. This is not a new idea. This is not a new idea. Uh, in fact, there's a um, brilliant management thinker from the 20th century named Peter Drucker. Yeah, we all, we all know quite a bit about this. Yeah, and he wrote explicitly about unmet needs yes. and their centrality in the innovation process. Mm-hmm. So, and we give pointers to to his books and where you can read more on that. But discover discover customers' unmet needs is. Um, is super, super important, and it comes from the direct customer observation. So those are steps one and two, direct 
customer observation and the discovery of customers' key unmet needs. Mm -hmm. Then that brings us to step three, which is involve the rest of the organization in what you're doing uh, in order to build consensus on what needs to happen. Right. So this is this is a step that is often missed in all of the discussions about user experience or customer experience that I've read or heard or witnessed over the years. Practitioners of these uh, research methods generally like to be handed a project so that they can go and, and practice it and come back with the results. Mm -hmm. And I mean, th there, there are exceptions, of course, but over the years, I've seen relatively few practitioners stand up and say, hey, you know, just as important as the method we use is the cooperation and the participation of the senior decision makers on the team. Sure. Or if you're in a startup, the other partners in the startup. Mm -hmm. People talk about office politics often stymieing uh, progress or uh, creating obstacles to uh, good decisions. You know, there's a great way to break through politics. That is, get all of the stakeholders involved in the research, in the process. Sure. And because if, if you have faction A or partner A with their own opinions and, and pet ideas and projects, mm -hmm. and they're opposed by faction B or partner B, they're, they're not going to be able to generally convince each other. Generally, it's, um, it's just a power play, and power plays don't usually turn out so well for the customer. However, there is, there is one person that both faction A and faction B will listen to and agree to change their minds in favor of, and that's the customer. Sure. So if you can, if you can get all the <coughs> warring parties in front of the customer and observe the customer directly and discover their key unmet needs and then discuss what needs to happen next, uh, generally a consensus forms pretty easily and pretty quickly. And we've had clients tell us that it was as amazing as the moonshot. I mean, it was a, it was a uh, life-changing experience for them to mm -hmm. see the power of that environment where warring stakeholders put down their weapons and start talking to each other simply by dint of the customer being a part of the discussion. So basically what, uh, what you're saying is that actually in order to take care of step three, more easily, you actually have to get all the stakeholders involved in step one and step two um, to facilitate that. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I mean, because it seems to me also is that there's an old saying which says strategy without execution is nothing but a good idea. Yeah, that's uh, right. And, and so it means it seems like almost like one and two is almost a preparation of a strategy, but the three, but the three part is all about execution and execution requires consensus, uh, approval, sponsorship, and all those different things. And mm -hmm. rather, if you want to get that bit right, you've, all, you've got to get people involved in the whole, the idea and the strategy, strategy part as well, right at the very, very start. Well, that's a, that's a really good way to put it, that it's about execution. Uh -huh. I mean, we, we, we say in the book that there's been a lot written about different research methods or innovation methods, mm -hmm. but not enough written about the results yeah. that need to come out of. And so if you're a practitioner who knows every last research method in the toolkit, but you can't point to well-defined results that those methods have created, what is it worth? Mm -hmm. what, what, what's a method worth if it doesn't create some real world results? Sure. Sure. You know, and there are case studies in the book where I'm sure that, well, let me put that a different way. There are case studies in the book where designers and self-styled innovators have used some of the latest, trendiest methods and are, in one case, bragging about the greatness of their method, even while the result of the project is actually terrible. Yes. Uh, so that's another thing we're trying to correct in this book, to say, look, let's not be so enamored of our methods and our buzzwords that we forget what this is about. Sure. 
Well, that's a breath of fresh air. Well, that's and that's good news. But I also think the other th the other implication for this, it seems to me, is that in many uh, arenas, customer experience can often be the purvey of the marketing department or you know marketing generally. But I guess what you're actually saying is that actually, when you think about the building the consensus across the organisation and the observation of of customers directly, you have to get more than just marketing people involved. So this almost, if you, you, you then now are yeah. talking about customer experiences, this is this is whole business. Yes, yeah. This is. You'll note that the word or the phrase "customer experience" does not appear in the title or the subtitle. Yeah. Of the book, this is not a book about "quote unquote" customer experience as it's been described or taught um, over the last few years. Yeah, it's not about this is, it's not about technologies. Actually, about the customers. Well, it's about. Uh, I'm I'm just I'm just a wee bit biased, but I think the message of this book is one of the most important messages that we can get to the business world, from startups to enterprises, and from veteran business people to uh, you know students. Mm -hmm. And everybody in between. This this is not a book about the discipline of customer experience. This book is about what we're here for. Yes. When we're doing business or innovation. And this is this is the this is the message that I close the book with yeah. in chapter ten. Why are we here? At least why are we here doing these these projects. Why are we here innovating, mm -hmm. creating new companies? Mm -hmm. What is a company for? Sure. Have you ever thought about that? Has this come up on on your podcast before? What is a company for? That's an interesting question to reflect on. What is a company for? Well, as it turns out, Peter Drucker wrote about that very question. I got to love you for this because you're going. This ago. is one of my favorite quotes. I think. <laughs> There's only one reason for the existence of a company and that is to create a customer and what what Peter Drucker means by that is a company is supposed to create some benefit mm -hmm. to the customer yeah and by benefit I mean something that's actually good for them mm -hmm. so you have to think about what's good what's mm -hmm. good that you want to create for somebody else yeah now this is this is not this is not a rant about social innovation or you know world saving nonprofit work you can you can you can run a great nonprofit or social innovation firm or you can run a very profitable company and still be creating good experiences and and real benefits for the customer sure sure but either way you have to think about who who's the customer and what benefit do I want to create for that person sure Okay, and if you start if you start thinking about your work and your career with, with that perspective, then it becomes almost blindingly obvious mm -hmm. that if the point of your career is to create benefits for somebody, you should probably understand a little bit about who that person is and what they want. Yeah. And so the, the idea then of just let me create something really cool and send it out there and customers, if they're lucky, can aspire to be cool enough to use my thing, which is how innovation is often run these days, Yeah, becomes completely asinine. Yes. Okay? It's great to make cool things. You know, Steve Jobs made a lot of cool things, and I, I, I admire him for that. But he didn't do it in a vacuum. No. He simply wanted to be cool. It's actually just the opposite. He was thinking constantly about what is the great benefit that we can create for these customers that we're trying to serve. Mm -hmm. That's the that is the perspective. That's the worldview that we're trying to offer in this book. Um, and by the way, the 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 method that we talk about. The method that we talk about, the customer research method of listening labs, we say in the book is is not necessarily the the one method to <laughs> rule them all. You know, there are many different ways of including the customer. Sure. The the baseline is 
do you care enough about the customer you say you're here to serve sure. in order to, to, to do the necessary work of including them and, and finding out what they want and building the consensus mm -hmm. to execute on that? Sure. That's the question. Well, absolutely. I mean, it's. I guess it's like, if you think about it from an executive's perspective, is is to say, well, are you, you know, if you're not willing to prior, if you're willing, if you're prioritizing all sorts of internal meetings and this and that and the other over your customers, then you you just haven't got it. That's right. Because actually, your customers and spending time with them and observing them and talking with them and understanding what what they like and what they don't like and what they want and what they don't want. Etc. That, that's the best use of your time. Well, it's essential. I'm not going to once well, again. It's not the best, it's not the best use of your time. It's an important use of your time. Don't yes, you? that's that's the key. That's the key. We have to make sure we don't make the mistake of of, of the executives giving lip service to the idea of being customer centered. We're not saying that an executive is only there to spend time with customers. And customers are the center of the universe. No, what we're saying is that the business world seems to have forgotten or perhaps never learned that customers are an essential part yes. of the innovation process. They're not the only part. Yes, okay. But yeah, okay. They have to be one part as opposed to not a part, which is what usually happens. Yes. So the the message of the book I think is a it's an extremely important message and it's actually not that high a bar to clear. Yeah. It's a pretty low bar. Instead of completely ignoring your customers, try including them a little bit and see what happens. <laughs> if we can get every startup company and mid-sized organization and enterprise firm in the world to just include the customers a little bit, we will see world-changing results. Yeah. I mean, I think the um, one, of the, one of the reasons that I started um, – I started blogging was that I have a, a well a passion for not passion for bad service I passionately don't like bad service but, <laughs> but I also fervently believe that actually delivering service which is a little bit better is actually not that hard to do but actually if we if every company took it took it upon themselves to actually d just deliver a little bit better then the world would be a better place. That's right. And by the way, those companies would be achieving their financial goals much more easily. Absolutely. In the, in the long run, in the long run. Absolutely. So, I mean, we're, we're, you and I are definitely talking off the, uh, off the same page, so, you know, which is great. So but I really like the idea of it. And it's, it's, it feels a very, it's not a nuanced view, but it's, it is a sort of slight nuance on, on where things are, because I think in, in many ways, that the way the business the business world seems to try and separate things out very much, and what you're saying is like this is not a binary question. It's not like customers at the center or nothing. It's like customers need to be in the mix. That's right. They need to be included. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, That's and, it. And 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 the beyond the beyond that uh, simple but very important message, the book offers case studies that. Uh, people can use when they're trying to convince the boss or other stakeholders or even direct reports yep. why they need to do things a little bit differently. And at the back of the book is, uh, I think, about 20 pages of endnotes mm -hmm. where you can see the depth of research we did in, in putting this together. And um, and there's a recommended reading list as well. So the, in, in, between the, the covers of this book are pointers to if people want many years of study <laughs> well, to I'm, I'm, I'm complete sure, their education. Well, absolutely. I'm sure there, I will, um, we'll point people in the, in the direction of the book and I'm sure there'll be, some, there'll be some of us that are, will will be wading through the research annals for, for more information. And some people will just believe, will just believe it to be true or just feel it to be true and just go off and, and, and do it and then start including their customers. That would make me very happy. Fantastic. So, Mark, in the interest of time I, and, and saving your time a little bit, is there anything else that you'd like to add for our readers and list, uh, listeners before we just before we start to wrap up about the book? Well, if, beyond 
uh, reading the book at customersincluded.com. <laughs> if I could give people one tip, mm-hmm. it's often people, well, you know, what is one thing I can walk away from? Sure. Just try if if you haven't gotten in front of a customer in person in the last year or two, and for many executives, it's it's never they've never done it. Sure. Just try doing the most simple and formal interaction possible. Just get in front of a customer in whatever context that they use your product or service Mm -hmm. and just watch. Sure. Just watch and ask them some clarifying questions and try to learn how your product or service, the, the, the customer experience you create fits into their lives. And, you'll be surprised at what you learn from, from just a short interaction. Fantastic. And Mark, there's always this one, I think you might have just already answered it, but I'll give you another chance to double up on it. But there's always one question that I always finish these interviews with. And that is, is there anything that you would like to shamelessly plug? Customersincluded.com. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Nice and sweet. And there's a, there's, it's the book is available from there and... It's the book is available from there. We're we're selling it um, ourselves. Okay. And uh, it's also available on Amazon. Okay. And uh, the next question that we've gotten from a lot of people is when is the ebook coming? Right. Uh, And um, hopefully, sometime soon after this podcast is posted, the ebook will be available. It's still in production. Okay. But uh, we are working on an ebook, and we are beginning to work on an audio book. So that should be available at some point in the future. Fantastic. We are going to do everything we can to spread this message as far and wide as we can because we think uh, it's uh, we feel excited about it, but we also feel a responsibility to uh, to try to get this amplified because we feel it's a very important message for the business world and and the world at large. Fantastic. I mean, Mark, well, I'll make sure I get all that linked up and give you a big uh, customersincluded.com and all the other links, a big shout out. And uh, just wanted to say, finally, thank you for your time today. That's been brilliant. Thank you, Adrian. I really appreciate you inviting me onto the show. My, my pleasure.